Hey guys, my name is Nick. I'm a Microsoft Certified Expert and Administrator. I create a lot of content for MSPs. Today's video, I'm covering the March 2021 updates from Microsoft. If you've watched my previous update videos, you know I focus in on what is relevant to the MSP space, really block out all the noise from the enterprise updates. There's tons of updates that come up from Microsoft each month. And I really focus in on trying to be more proactive on what will affect our end users getting documentation out there to hopefully reduce help desk calls, tickets, things like that. Before I get into today's video, I just wanted to mention if you guys want to see a lot of content around Microsoft 365 in the MSP space, be sure to subscribe. Getting into it here though, I'm going to be starting with Microsoft Teams and to be honest, this is going to be a lot of the updates that I covered today because there was a ton this month in the sense of Teams. And this is obviously where they're spending most of their investment from a dev perspective. This first one here is related to spotlights coming into Teams meeting. Spotlights are what you see here on the left hand side as far as the screenshot goes where you can have enhanced visual uh, images of the participants. You can now do up to a maximum of seven participants simultaneously in this meeting and it just allows for better user experience. They're redoing this whole UI basically from the video and sharing perspective which I'll get into in a later um, portion of this particular update video. Timeline for this though is gonna happen in April. The next one here is related to the approvals app within Teams. I created a YouTube video on approvals and you can watch, check that out on my YouTube channel. But if you're not familiar, it basically allows you to do basic approval workflows using the Power Automate as the backend within Microsoft Teams. So things like maybe expense approvals or documentation approvals, things like that you can do collectively between two users or multiple users within your organization. With this update, they're extending an integration with Adobe Sign, which I think is really cool, so that you can do e-signature approval as well within this. And this capability will be coming out in mid-April. It does require you as an admin to log into the Teams Admin Center to enable this uh, from within the app section itself. But then it allows them to sign in with their Adobe profile and start using e-signature abilities as well. Call merge here, if you're using the VoIP capabilities within Teams, it allows users to have the one-on-one -on -one calls that are on hold or uh, calls that are on hold within a group to be merged as well. And so users will be able to do that. And you can see in the screenshot here, the three little dots there you can click on and, and merge the calls between two that you have set up, which is pretty cool. This will be happening in late March and be complete by mid-April. The next one here is related to Mac users and Safari. So previously, the video sharing capabilities, the camera sharing capabilities were not supported in Safari, and with this update, they now will be. So if you had any end users complaining about that or having that as a concern, this will now be available for them, and that should have happened already, potentially, um, if not in, in late March here. This next one is related to polls within Microsoft Teams. So previously, guests or anonymous users weren't able to apply or reply to polls within Teams, and now they are able to do so. You're also able to create polls within the meeting as it's going on versus just before the meeting. Uh, so a couple of new updates there might not be relevant to a lot of users, but I wanted to mention it here because it is something that's going to be more and more important as we continue through you know, remote work moving forward. And this will begin in mid-April. This next one I think here is pretty interesting where they created the ability for you as an admin to create auto claim policies. And when I say that, I mean that you can create a policy that allocates a license to a user if they sign into the Teams application. So this is saying something like, I have licenses like Microsoft Standard, Microsoft Business Premium that include a Teams license. And if there's one available and this user signs into the Teams app, it'll auto assign that license to that user. Again, if there's one available, that is the major caveat there. So this is only supported within Microsoft Teams app itself, as in they can sign into that and get auto assigned a license. But I'm interested to see as they expand this, if they include all the licenses or the applications as well. The only caveat is obviously is you have to be on top of always having available license in there, but it might reduce one of your steps to user onboarding in the sense that you don't have to assign a license to a user anymore. You can just tell them to go sign into Teams 
and it'll allow them to auto sign the license but it obviously has to work within your process you have today there's there's various ways in which you you perform these actions so it has to be making sense there the next one here is if you use teams templates this is another one that i have as a video on my youtube channel if you're not familiar with templates but they basically allow you to set up apps and the configuration um, as a template that you can recreate over and over again if you have duplicate efforts there in, in the sense of your team channels. With this addition, you can now add URLs to the team channel. So let's say you have a company that always wants to have their SharePoint site as, a, as one of the tabs within the team channel. You can now do this as part of the templates. Again, just reducing your steps as an admin to create these team channels. This will happen in late March and will be done by early April. Next one here is really more granular controls around video sharing. So as an organizer of a meeting, you're able to disable the camera or enable it before the meeting starts. Or as you see here on the right with the screenshot, you're able to disable the cameras mid-meeting. So again, this is just more granular controls in that sense. The one concern I had is if you enable the camera for all attendees on the left-hand side screenshot there, does it mean that it's going to just pop up their camera for everybody? And they clarified that in the article and mentioned that it, it is not. It's just giving them the ability to turn it on or off. It's not auto turning it on for them. So no concerns there. And that'll happen in mid-April. Next one here is really just around UI. There's no real action you need to take. It's really about just improving the experience from the video sharing perspective and chat and all that. So it's, it's basically enhancing the capabilities here. And that'll happen in mid-April as well too. These next three here are related to the administrator updates. PowerShell module for Teams 2.0 is coming out here. The biggest update around that is that the main commandlet to connect is now connect-microsoft teams versus the CS login commandlet that was used previously for Teams and, and legacy Skype for Business online. But now you'll be able to use that uh, solely, which is much more logical workflow for connecting and I'll have a PDF here available below this video that you can use to go and check that out and I'll have the links to the modules as well uh, so you can check all that out as well too. Next one here is more of a compliance enhancement where you're able to de-identify PII in the Teams admin usage reports. I'm not sure if you're using these today but they allow you to see a bunch of activity from the Teams perspective and um, today in all the reports in there have always been non-de-identifiable. Uh, and this is the first one that they're gonna do. It might be something that you wanna report to a CIO within an organization, um, but they're, they're heavy compliance sensitive. They might be a healthcare company or something like that. And you just wanna show the information about the activity going on versus the individual user activity and their name and everything like that. So it's giving you the ability to de-identify that information. This last one here I consider to be more of a security and compliance concern, but they're going to be starting to introduce these banners for the mobile users of Microsoft Teams where it's going to say, hey, did you know you can set up a personal account as well? And I don't really like this because it brings up a lot of concerns, again, for security and compliance in the sense that if you do not have a DLP policy in place or a mobile application management policy in place with Intune, for instance, um, you are at risk for that user creating a personal account and then going in and starting to save corporate documents within there as well too without any ability to, to actually strip that if you're not managing that device. So if you don't have this in place, they do allow you to submit a support request to not show this banner um, or you're able to do a little bit heavier configuration where they're not able to add a secondary account beyond the worker school account. And that's kind of what I recommend as far as actions goes just to avoid the mess and compliance concerns around what this could become. So let's go start at the end of April. And we're going to be doing this for the rest of this year in the sense of displaying this banner and tenants. So I try to get ahead of it sooner rather than later. Moving into Exchange here, this next couple are, are kind of interesting in the sense that they're extending the ability to granularly define the policies for anti-spam, anti-phishing, anti-malware, and safe attachments with Defender for Office 365, previously known as Defender for ATP. And this is allowing you to be able to give the sender the capability or the, the user, I should say, uh, to request a release of a message that's in quarantine. 
And the second one here is allowing you to put custom branding and messaging onto that, what that looks like for them as well too. So it's giving them more control in order to say, hey, this is actually a legitimate message for you. And you can re then review that and release that back into their inbox. This obviously is a big change if you make it. You want to potentially connect this back to your PSA tool. So you get a ticket when somebody requests this. But it is interesting in the sense that um, you would give the user the more control here versus having them reach out reactively and saying, I never got this message, where is it? So that's a little bit interesting. Again, it would require some process changes for you potentially, but it would be cool to have a little bit more granular control if you would want that. Last one here is also for Exchange, at least is, is also for uh, security enhancements in my opinion. It's related to being able to show an external tag and, and message information for external messages that come through to a user. And it's just giving them a little bit more of a heads up and visual appeal to say, hey, this is in your organization, so you want to pay a little bit more attention to this. And uh, with that, it's not enabled by default, but you can enable it uh, within the policy or with PowerShell. It's available right now to do, but it is only going to show up in OWA or iOS or Android applications, not the client. So just be aware of that. Next section here, last section is related to just admin updates in general. Uh, so first one here, there's conglomerate branding for global admins where you're able to provide more than just one theme in the sense of custom branding within the organization. Traditionally, this has always been one, but now Microsoft is allowing you to apply it to 365 groups. You can do up to five within the tenant. This is cool because you might have M&A activity where you have multiple organizations that are working together uh, under the same tenant that might have different branding that you want to use or just different groups in general that are silos of the organization. The one caveat I would mention is that if you do this, it will remove the background image when users sign in if they're not assigned anything else, like if they're not part of these groups that have the branding. So just be aware of that um, when you set this up. That's the one thing that I would mention. That's coming in late April and expected to complete by mid-June. The next one here is related to two new custom roles uh, that reduce the global admin dependency, which is authentication policy administrator and domain name administrator. It's pretty straightforward in the sense that authentication policy can relate to MFA settings you set up, things like that, and domain name is really just controlling the domains uh, that were within the, the organization and, and setting up new ones as well, things like that so that you don't have to be a full global admin to go in and, and do these things. Again, just reducing your attack surface. Next one here is another security enhancement if you want to turn it on for users, which is related to MFA sign-in activity. And this is giving you the ability to set a code match instead of just like a push notification or something like that. Or, and again, if you want to set the number that they type in as well, I think this one is a little bit more security conscious because anybody could get a push notification and just say like, oh, I don't know what this is and just approve it. Not that they would, but you know how end users are can, can be sometimes in that sense. So it's giving them the ability, they have to match a code that they see on their screen, but this will be available in early April for you to be able to turn on if you wanted this as well for your users to start using instead of a push notification for MFA. Next one here is related to just migration capabilities. They're giving you the native capability to migrate Box to Microsoft 365 OneDrive in the admin center. And this allows you to, one, scan your exact Box environment to match, to perform a soft match with your users in OneDrive. And it will show you prematurely like how much data is in each account, which is really cool. And then it'll allow you to start the migration process to start pumping in those files and folders into the OneDrive accounts of these users. So it's gonna go into public preview in mid-March and then uh, be expected to complete in late March here. So GA isn't until June though. So public preview is already kind of happening, but it won't be generally available for everybody until uh, June of this year, tentatively, that's what they said. So the last one here I want to mention as well, which is a little bit more of a concern to me as well too, is this self-service product capability they're introducing for end users themselves. It's giving them end users the ability to purchase their own subscriptions. And currently this is only going to encompass Power BI and Power Automate, but I am concerned 
of this extending to all the schemes potentially and this being a, a concern in the sense of an MSP getting their licenses from a CSP provider and, and causing this big mess of users buying directly having support directly for these products but then also getting their base licenses from you and getting their support from you and it, it's going to create a you know a lot of confusion and a lot of problems if you have to then cancel those licenses and reorder with the CSP provider and things like that so I'd recommend using the PowerShell command list that I'll put in an article here to disable this so that they can't even see this altogether. And in the future, you know, that'll maintain all the products they might add to the self-service capability. But uh, it is more concerning there because I don't think that, you know, Microsoft's considering the MSP side of this where you wouldn't want that to be shown. But I'll include the link there within, within my guide as well. That's everything though I wanted to showcase for you guys for the updates here in March. I know it was kind of a longer video this week, but I just wanted to make sure we covered everything because there was a lot that, that went out that was relevant to MSPs. If you guys do have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, like I mentioned earlier, feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content around Microsoft 365 and the MSP space. Thanks guys. Have a great day.